and sounds. Now on BBC One, the BBC News at six with Rita Chakrabarty. Today at six, three days of rail strikes. Next week, we'll see half of the entire country's network grind to a halt. Those services that will run will start later than usual and end earlier. It'll mean days of frustration for passengers. It's going to be a real inconvenience for our pupils, um, especially at a time when we've got public examinations going on. We'll bring you details of where the trains will run and of those areas which face being entirely without a rail service. Also on the programme. Yorkshire County Cricket Club and a number of individuals are charged with bringing the sport into disrepute after claims of racism. Grounded, the plane due to take asylum seekers to Rwanda failed to take off, but the Home Secretary insists she's committed to the policy. December last year, there was eight metres of road between here and the end there. I measured it yesterday and we're down to 3.4 metres. And the community facing the rapid erosion of its coastline because of the rise in the level of the sea. And coming up on the BBC News Channel, former England captain Steph Horton is not in the squad for the women's Euros as coach Serena Wigman names her 23-player group for the tournament. Good evening. Britain faces days of severe travel disruption next week, with only a fifth of rail services due to run during strike action by workers. Passengers have been advised not to travel on trains unless necessary. 40,000 staff are due to walk out on June the 21st, the 23rd and the 25th in a row about pay, jobs and pensions. Network Rail has this map of where services will and won't run. The main urban centres are being prioritised, but that leaves huge swathes of Scotland without any train services on those dates. Similarly, areas west of Birmingham, including most of Wales and many coastal areas, will be unreachable by train. Our transport correspondent Katie Austin reports now on what's shaping up to be a week of travel chaos for many people. The clock is ticking down to the biggest rail strike in decades. Among those affected will be 300 children who take the train to this school in Bradford. Some have GCSE and A-level exams next week. Well, to be honest, I'm not even sure how I'll get to school. Like, for the past four years, I've got the train every single day. And I'm not sure my parents can give me less school. If my mum has to pick me up, it'll be much later, so I have less time to do stuff. In the mornings, I'd probably have to set off earlier, which means like being more punctual, getting up earlier, which just adds on to everything else. On the three walkout days, a fraction of normal services will operate on main routes, and some areas will get no trains at all. But the knock-on impact means disruption for the whole week. What makes this strike unusual is the involvement of crucial signalling staff working for Network Rail. Their replacements will only be able to cover a limited part of the day, so services that do run will start much later and finish much earlier. The RMT union says the dispute is over proposed job cuts and the need for a pay rise reflecting the cost of living. The industry is under pressure to save money following the impact of the pandemic. Rail bosses insist reform is needed and the man leading negotiations for Network Rail warned the two sides were still a way apart on key issues. We've approached these talks with a sense of creativity and imagination. I'm determined to try and find a way forward but I can't negotiate on, on my own. Uh, so yeah, we think we've, been, we've done everything we can and I, I can see a path through that would achieve a deal. But, but again, it does require movement on both sides. The RMT has claimed the government is standing in the way of a resolution. We're working very hard to get a settlement, but we think this is unlikely at the moment. And the reason we think it's unlikely is, call us cynical, but we think the government, uh, the Department for Transport, they're in the background holding the pen. It seems that they don't want a settlement. There's a lot of aggressive mood music coming from government at the moment. Today, the RMT called for an urgent meeting with the Transport Secretary and Chancellor, but the government dismissed the idea, saying unions must negotiate with the employers. 
While thousands of passengers rethink their plans, work is ongoing to figure out how much freight can be kept moving on the railways, for example, construction materials, fuel, food and drink. This firm says business customers have tried to stockpile, but even with contingency plans, the strikes will be disruptive. Of the three days, I, I think that's manageable. We can catch up either before or after the dispute. If it becomes a lengthy dispute, that's when you start to get into worries about whether commodities or, or stuff that goes on the shelf is likely to start being affected. Neither side seems to rate the chances of next week's strikes being called off. Whether more follow is now the big question. Katie's at Waterloo Station in London for us. And Katie, what are the chances of these strikes being called off? Well, what we've been hearing today is certainly that neither side feels enough progress has currently been made to prevent the strikes going ahead next week. Remember too that on Tuesday, the London Underground staff are also due to walk out, so additional disruption for the capital on that day. Now, negotiations between uh, the rail companies, Network Rail and the union will continue. Uh, but meanwhile, there was a fractious debate in Parliament this afternoon uh, in which the Transport Secretary said wages were already high, working practices needed modernising to safeguard the railway's future. But Labour accused ministers of deliberately failing to intervene, they said, to help find a solution to all this. Thanks very much. Katie Austin reporting there. And for full details on how the strike will affect services in your area, there are updates, news and analysis on BBC News Online, that is bbc.co.uk forward slash news, and also by using the BBC News app. Yorkshire Cricket Club and a number of individuals have been charged by the England and Wales Cricket Board with breaches of its code of conduct following an investigation into racism at the club. The charges relate to bringing the game into disrepute and breaking the anti-discrimination code and were brought after claims were made last year by the former player Azim Rafiq. He's welcomed the charges and said the process had been gruelling but necessary. Our sports editor Dan Rowan reports now from Headingley. English cricket was on a high. Yesterday's stunning victory over New Zealand in the second test, one of the greatest wins in the team's history. But just 24 hours later came the latest development in the saga that's cast a shadow over the sport. Yorkshire and a number of unnamed individuals charged by the ECB over allegations of racism at the county following a six-month investigation into its handling of claims made by former player Azim Rafiq. In a statement, the governing body said the charges arise from alleged breaches of conduct which is improper or which may be prejudicial to the interests of cricket or which may bring the ECB, the game of cricket or any cricketer into disrepute and its anti-discrimination code. Last year, Rafiq gave harrowing testimony to MPs about the racist abuse he said he'd suffered by some of his former colleagues at Yorkshire. There just seems to be an acceptance in the institution um, from the leaders and no one, no one ever stamped it out. The whistleblower claimed former teammate Gary Balance was among those to have used racist language towards him. Balance said he deeply regretted doing so. Former Yorkshire and England captain Michael Vaughan revealed he'd been accused of making racist comments to Rafiq and other players, but has repeatedly denied the claims. Today in a statement, Rafiq said he welcomed the charges, but that this has been another gruelling but unfortunately necessary process. But I hope this all means that no young player ever goes through such pain and alienation again. Last year, Yorkshire sparked outrage by not disciplining anyone despite Rafiq being found to have suffered racial harassment. The county plunged into crisis. A damning parliamentary report concluded discrimination was endemic in the sport and today one of its authors gave this reaction. The absolute key thing is what actually happens to the game more generally. Can we be certain there aren't other Yorkshires out there? And we need to be sure that the ECB uh, has a game under its control which is inclusive, which means that everyone from every background can feel safe and can feel welcomed in it. Having regained the lucrative international hosting rights it lost in the wake of the crisis after an overhaul in staff and various reforms, Yorkshire is now preparing to welcome England in the next test match here next week. But moving on from the scandal is proving no easy task. 
Well, an independent disciplinary panel will hear these cases in September and October. And I guess the fear of some here at Headingley will be that if Yorkshire is found guilty of bringing the game into disrepute, it could face a hefty fine, perhaps even a points deduction in the domestic competition or even the loss of those lucrative international hosting rights. Once again, individuals, meanwhile, may face possible suspensions. This was meant to be a really exciting period of time for Yorkshire, a buoyant England team in town next week, having been deserted by sponsors, they're slowly coming back as the county looks to try and make a fresh start. But today, a reminder that moving on could take several more months to come. Dan, thank you. Dan Rowan reporting there. Around 150 people have been brought ashore in Dover today as low winds created calm seas for the boats attempting to cross the channel. Yesterday, 444 people were rescued. That's the highest daily number in two months. Meanwhile, the government says that preparations are already underway for a new flight to take asylum seekers to Rwanda after the first plane was effectively grounded last night following a ruling by the European Court of Human Rights. The Home Secretary said she was disappointed by the ruling and that the government wouldn't be put off by what she called inevitable last-minute legal challenges. Our deputy political editor Vicky Young reports. Rescue missions in the Channel. Calm weather means more boats arriving. 11 came yesterday carrying more than 440 people, the highest number for two months. The government wants to discourage those taking this dangerous journey, but its policy to send them to Rwanda to claim asylum there is being buffeted from all sides. Statement, Home Secretary Priti Patel. Today, the Home Secretary said the UK had the right to control its borders. This government will not be deterred from doing the right thing. We will not be put off by the inevitable legal last-minute challenges, nor we will allow mobs, Madam Deputy Speaker, to block removals. We will not stand idly by and let organised crime gangs who are despicable in their nature and their conduct, evil people treat human beings as cargo. But Labour say the plans make Britain look shameful around the world. All she really cares about is picking fights and finding yeah. someone else yeah. to blame. Chasing this headline. isn't a long-term plan, it is a short-term stunt. About. Everyone can see it. It's, it's not about. serious policy, it's shameless posturing and she knows it. It's not building consensus, it's just pursuing division. It is government by gimmick. After days of legal action in the British courts, there were just four passengers due to leave on the first flight to Rwanda last night. After a last-minute intervention by a judge from the European Court of Human Rights, the plane stayed on the tarmac. Many Conservatives are now questioning the powers of that court in Strasbourg. This parliament is supreme. Our courts have said this is right. This is what the British people want us to do. Control immigration, come across in those boats. So how is it right? that this court is overruled, all of our courts yep. and this parliament. Yeah. Yeah. Politically, the Home Secretary might not be too bothered about a fight with lawyers here and a court in Strasbourg, but ultimately she does need to come up with a workable policy. Ploughing ahead with plans for another flight to Rwanda leaves ministers open to the accusation they could be wasting hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money. But until a flight does take off, it's hard to gauge what impact it will have on those trying to come here. At this unofficial camp in Dunkirk, many are thinking about their next move. Aram says he will still try to cross to England. He hopes he won't be sent to Rwanda, but says it would still be better than Iraqi Kurdistan. Off camera, some told the BBC the plans could make them think again. An uncertain journey lies ahead for these men and a key government policy. Vicky Young, BBC News, Westminster. Well, last night's judgment, which came less than an hour before the planned takeoff of that flight, has raised questions about the legal procedure surrounding cases like these. Well, here to answer a few of those questions is our home editor, Mark Easton. Mark. Thanks, Rita. It was the intervention of the European Court of Human Rights late last night that turned a flight to Rwanda into a flight to nowhere. But how come a judge in Strasbourg could effectively stop the policy of the UK government in its tracks? 
well, Britain has left the EU, of course, but we're still in the Council of Europe. That's entirely separate from the EU, set up after World War II to oversee a European Convention on Human Rights, with a court to make sure that signatories like Britain abide by their obligations. So how come the UK court said one thing and the European court said another? The answer is they were looking at slightly different things. The UK judges had to balance the right of a sovereign government to implement its policies against the potential harm to those due to be on last night's flight. They ruled the welfare concerns did not outweigh the, the right to govern, if you like, and that the plane could take off. But the judge in Strasbourg noted that the UK courts have agreed to adjudicate next month on whether the whole Rwanda policy is lawful or not. That judicial review is expected by the end of July. The Prime Minister has said he still wants to send asylum seekers to Rwanda before the lawfulness of the policy has been tested in court. Last night, the European Court stopped the flight. The judge was worried that if the policy was found to be unlawful, those people sent to East Africa might be unable to come back to the UK and that potentially breached their rights under the European Convention. So should, could asylum seekers be sent to Rwanda in the six weeks before the lawfulness of the whole scheme has been decided? The Home Office says it's already preparing the next removal plane and while it could attempt to argue its case at the European Court perhaps, it, it must be in doubt that any asylum seeker will be sent to Rwanda before August or at all. Mark, many thanks. Well, the government is also embroiled in a separate battle with the European Union over the post-Brexit arrangements for Northern Ireland, known also as the Protocol. Today, the EU announced that it's taking legal action over the UK's plans to scrap parts of that deal. Earlier in the week, ministers in Westminster outlined a bill aimed at unilaterally changing arrangements on trade, tax and governance, which were written into the 2019 deal. Well, our Europe editor, Katja Adler, is here with me. And Katja, the government says it's been forced to act but the EU doesn't agree. No. Um, Rita, the, the EU is furious. It says that this post-Brexit agreement on Northern Ireland was designed by UK and EU negotiators to do three things, basically. One, protect the peace process in Northern Ireland. Two, protect internal UK trade. And also, three, to protect the EU single market uh, after Brexit. Uh, so it said it, it, it had all of those plans in mind, designed together, signed off together in law. And if there are problems with the workings of that agreement known as a protocol, and that you admits there are problems with it, then it says solutions should be found together. Today, Brussels said that the UK going it alone to change the agreement is illegal. So yes, it's launched these legal proceedings. They'll take a long time. They could result in fines for the UK. But the EU has also threatened possible trade barriers to UK goods further down the line if it thinks it's necessary. There's no appetite really for a trade war. And actually, both sides say they'd rather negotiate their way to a settlement, but the government says the EU isn't listening properly. It says the protocol, this uh, Northern Ireland agreement, isn't working properly. It's upsetting, it says, the delicate political and social balance in Northern Ireland. And that's why the government says it feels forced, for now, to go it alone. Katya, many thanks. The time is 17 minutes past six, our top story this evening. Three days of rail strikes next week will see half of the entire country's network grind to a halt. And the England squad for the Women's Euros is announced ahead of next month's tournament. Coming up in Sports Day on the BBC News Channel, more on the charges that have been brought against a number of individuals by English cricket's governing body in relation to allegations of racism at Yorkshire. Rising sea levels mean that nearly 200,000 properties in England may have to be abandoned in the next 30 years, according to a report today. It says about a third of England's coast will be put under pressure by the rise in sea levels, which could increase by as much as a metre by the end of the century. Well, our climate and environment correspondent Jonah Fisher is in the village of Haysborough on the Norfolk coast. Jonah. Yes, Haysborough has one of the fastest eroding coastlines in the UK. 20 years ago, there were 12 houses uh, behind me now, a long road stretching out. That's all gone now. If you just look at the road here, well, that's eroding at a rate of about four metres since December 
last year. Now, why are we here today? Well, there's a report that's come out today that suggests that possibly as many as 200,000 homes and businesses in England could be at risk from rising sea level rises. The issues that people here in Haysborough are facing at the moment relating to climate change, erosion and rising sea levels, well, those are issues that many people around the UK could well be facing in the years ahead. December last year, about the middle of it, there was eight metres of road between here and the end there. I measured it yesterday and we're down to 3.4. The coast at Haysborough is eroding fast. Bryony's bungalow was lost to the sea in 2013, but she's refused to admit defeat and has moved just 50 metres inland. But you're still basically on the front line. I am. It's now the policy of the government and the district council not to build new sea defences here, much to Bryony's annoyance. I feel it's an unpatriotic attitude. Not everyone in Haysborough thinks the water should be fought. The sea, no one will ever stop that. It's even more powerful than Boris Johnson, would you believe? Malcolm it has is... spent the last two decades trying to save Haysborough and has now come to the view that organised retreat is the best way forward. So you either commit to spending billions mm -hmm. over an extended period, or you say, OK, in the light of what's coming with climate change and sea level rise, we will do a, a properly managed withdrawal and look after the people as we go. Scientists predict a sea level rise of about 30 centimetres by 2050 and possibly as much as a metre by the end of the century. That may not sound much, but it will bring with it flooding and waves that have increased energy and power, smashing into our shoreline, reshaping our coast. But what shape? A new study published today says that by 2050, it may not be possible to defend as many as 200,000 English homes and businesses from the sea. There's not going to be money, probably, under current funding rules, but also we're not sure if we would, it would be really difficult to do. Our coast would be quite different from what it looks like now. It just wouldn't be practical and wouldn't be affordable. Tough decisions lie ahead. What should we protect and what let go? Jonah Fisher, BBC News in North Norfolk. Let's take a look now at some of the other stories making the news today. Shoppers who return goods to the collapsed fashion brand Misguided won't get their money back, according to the administrators who are winding up the company. The business has been bought by the Fraser's Group, but the company won't be able to honour refunds. It means that customers will be left to claim through their credit card. Petrol prices have hit new record highs every day for the past month, according to the RAC. The cost of filling up a family car now stands at about £103 for petrol and £106 for diesel. The war in Ukraine and moves to reduce dependence on Russian oil have continued to drive up fuel prices. The first instalment of a payment to help people struggling to pay rising energy bills will be made by the end of July. £326 will be given automatically to low-income households on benefits from the 14th of July. Next Thursday, June the 23rd, we'll see a crucial test for Boris Johnson's government with two by-elections, Tiverton and Honiton in Devon and also Wakefield in West Yorkshire. So let's take a look now at the context behind the vote in one of these constituencies, and that is Wakefield. It was one of the Conservatives' many gains in the 2019 general election, and they got a majority here of 3,000 358. Now, Labour had held this seat for nearly 90 years before that Tory victory, meaning it's exactly the kind of heartland seat that Sir Keir Starmer needs to win back. As you can see here, there'll be 15 candidates standing in the by-election, which happens in just over a week's time. Our political correspondent Alex Forsyth reports now from Wakefield ahead of next week's vote. Behind every door in Wakefield, there's a decision to be made. A political choice in a by-election that's being closely watched. Robert, who's lived here for 50 years, has certainly noticed the attention. There's been plenty of paraphernalia coming through the door, like, you know. 
It's promises and promises. A few streets away, Mary and Billy have also had canvases knock at their door. Most people I've talked to are absolutely amazed that there's 15 candidates for one job. <laughs> It is a crowded field. Historically, this was a Labour stronghold, but support crumbled in 2019 when Boris Johnson swept through parts of the Midlands and North. Now the fight's on again. Labour is pushing hard while the Conservatives are trying to hold support. At a local heritage site, some are clear who's got theirs. I like Boris. I think on all the major issues, he has done absolutely brilliantly. I'm just thinking about voting Labour. With what the policies are, I just go with that. I think we need someone else instead of Boris Johnson. I just think he's a fool. In the city centre, there's talk of the need for investment, jobs, better public transport. Local issues matter in a contest with national significance. This by-election is being seen as something of a test for the party leaders. After recent political turmoil, can Boris Johnson still command support in places like this? For Sir Keir Starmer, can he rebuild Labour's backing where he really needs to? Tattoo artist Dave was a Labour voter all his life, but switched to the Tories in 2019 because of Brexit. Now, facing the struggle of rising bills, he's lost faith across the board. Let us down, really. Boris Johnson had delivered. I think they could have kept the vote here. I'd like to think I could have voted Labour, but no, not with Keir Starmer in. Nobody represents working people anymore. Not far away, Scott, whose specialist woodshop we first visited during the pandemic, shares a sense of disillusion. They just want that little notch on the belt of we've got Wakefield again. It should go to who's ever going to do best for Wakefield. It's not about it's red or blue because as soon as this by election is done, we'll be forgot about again. For now, though, the political focus is on Wakefield, where smaller parties and independents are among those vying for residents' votes in a contest that promises to measure the public mood and leave letterboxes full of leaflets. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Wakefield. With under a month to go until England hosts the Women's Euros, the squad for the tournament has been confirmed. The Duke of Cambridge, who was president of the Football Association, met the England team at St George's Park earlier today. Our sports correspondent Jane Dougal has more. Yeah, we'll about this side of the England team now. <laughs> An alternative career for the young princes and princess, perhaps. The Duke of Cambridge was delighted with England shirts for his three young children. His Royal Highness was visiting St George's Park to wish the women's squad luck ahead of their home Euros tournament, scheduled to start in three weeks' time. As president of the FA, the Prince has been a keen supporter of the women's team for some time. Yeah, it means a lot to us. Obviously, we're all very proud to represent England and just obviously a genuine interest about us and our well-being and how we've sort of coped with everything. He's aware that we've not had much time off and that we're going straight into a tournament. Charlotte wants me to tell you that she's really good in goal. <laughs> like so many other young girls of her age, Princess Charlotte, apparently a keen footballer. And what better way to inspire the next generation of female footballers than with a home tournament? It'll also be a huge platform for the England players themselves. Well, those who have made the cut, that is. Horton, one now. The big news in the squad announcement, former captain Steph Horton will not take part. A tough decision for the head coach. We supported her as good as possible. She came into training, she's in a very good place, but just not ready to compete, I think. It's just a matter of time and we don't have that time. For the 23 who are going, it's a chance at a trophy in a major tournament and with Northern Ireland in the same group, a home nations match. With this level of support, it's an open goal for growing the women's game. The tournament is a success before it's even begun. England's opening match against Austria at Old Trafford on the 6th of July is sold out. And if either England or Northern Ireland are fortunate enough to get to the final at Wembley, they too will be playing in front of a full stadium. Thank you, Jane. Now, extreme flooding has forced Yellowstone National Park in the US to remain closed for days. It's the first summertime closure in 30 years caused by a natural disaster. 
All entrances have been shut since Monday. Rangers have warned of extremely hazardous conditions with pictures, as you can, sh you can see, showing a house and large sections of a paved road being pulled into the Gardner River. Park officials said the deluge has led to rock slides, to mudslides and also to power outages. Time for a look at the weather now. Thomas, not flooding, but very high temperatures. Yeah, pretty extreme uh, temperatures across western parts of Europe this early in the summer. So you can see in excess of 40 degrees Celsius um, in Spain tomorrow. Uh, not that unusual, of course, in the summer for Spain, but we are quite early in the season. And this heat is actually going to be wafting up across France and then to the UK over the next uh, couple of days or so. So we'll see temperatures probably peaking at around 33 or 4 degrees in the south of the country. But not everybody has had heat today. Yes, it's reached 28 degrees in London, but the clouds have been rain bearing across parts of Northern Ireland and Scotland. So through the course of this evening, cloudy and damp here in places, but way towards the south. We've got lots of sunshine here through the evening and then the clear skies through tonight. Temperatures were where we have the heat island in London around 14 degrees, but the rest of the country closer to around 11 or 12. So tomorrow, not much to say for England and Wales. It's just going to be sunshine all round right from the morning onwards. The temperatures will be skyrocketing, but across, in, across Northern Ireland and Scotland here, I think often cloudy with some showers around 19 degrees. Now we reached 28 degrees today in the southeast. I wouldn't be surprised if we get around 30 tomorrow already. And then the, during the course of Thursday night into Friday, we'll see this weather front approaching the northwest of the UK. This is the cooler air in the Atlantic that's ready to come our way. And you can see this much fresher Atlantic air here ahead of a cold front and then that heat coming in from the south across parts of England. So not everybody's going to get the heat. It's going to be a brief spell, a hot spell if you like, but probably technically just reaching heat wave criteria, for example, in the southeast, 33 or 34 degrees, but for many other parts of the country, nowhere near as hot. And of course, not many of us actually do like extreme temperatures. And then, surprise, surprise, if you've got any plans for the weekend, well, it does look as though it's all going to go bang. I mean, some of that energy has to go somewhere, Risa. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you, Thomas. And that was the BBC News at six from the team here at Broadcasting House. You can, of course, keep up with all the latest developments on the BBC News channel and on the website. But on BBC One, the news continues. It's now time to join our colleagues across the nations and regions for the news where you are. From me, bye-bye.